Okay, so thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to have to start by covering some of the same things that uh, that Peter did, but um, regrettably in a slightly different notation. So, uh, but but anyway, uh, and I'll because I'm a mathematician, I, I won't be able to cover so many sort of physical areas, unfortunately, so it will be sort of restricted to, to sort of slightly simpler situation. So let me, let me uh, review again the, uh, um, the situation for pneumatic liquid crystals, which is one of the classes of um, liquid crystals. So, so the pneumatics consist of rod-like molecules, so one of them the MBBA, and the other one I'll talk about a little bit is, is 5CB. And um, I, I was interested when I went to the internet and uh, found some space-filling models of these uh, molecules because um, um, they, um, uh, you know, they don't look quite like I expected. You know, they're not exactly rods, are they? I mean, and then you can. Uh, um, why, why this is going so big? Okay, and here's five CB. Uh, even even less like uh, this, these special rods than I, than I thought. So, so these are space-filling models which are supposed to represent what the, what the uh, um, molecule actually looks like. So uh, now, um, so the, the, the pneumatics arise from an isotropic to pneumatic phase transformation at a critical temperature, theta critical. So for theta bigger than theta critical, um, it's, it's, it's isotropic. And then uh, between uh, theta critical and some other temperature, um, uh, theta m, it's pneumatic. And then uh, at theta m, it, it, it's all right, please don't. It's, it's fine, I'm fine, thank you. Um, uh, so uh, at, at theta m, uh, the, um, the, uh, um, something else happens. It either turns into another liquid crystal phase or, or into, uh, in, into some solid phase. And uh, so, for example, for MBBA, the temperatures are 45 degrees and 17 degrees. So the, the range of temperatures is, 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 I suppose, relatively small. Now, here's, here's, um, here's a picture of this, here's a movie of this transition uh, taken from a very interesting website in Cambridge. Um, is that, does it start it going? No, I don't. Okay, I'm going to start again. There we go. Uh, where you can download lots of interesting movies on uh, on, on on materials. Uh, so this is reducing the temperature and going from the isotropic to the pneumatic phase. Maybe Peter could do a running commentary on what we're actually seeing here, because I, I, d I don't understand everything that we see in this, in this picture. There's a new creation of pneumatic domains, and I think that they coalesce, and, and eventually you see the director field becoming more and more uniform. <coughs> You're getting lots of defects here, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. <coughs> okay. Uh, now, so how do we describe all this mathematically? Well, so the first description would be to uh, represent the pneumatic phase by the, the mean orientation of the molecules. So, so that's, that's, a, that's a unit vector. So here is the uh, a situation where the <coughs> molecules are pointing more or less vertically upwards, and here's the unit vector. But as Peter remarked, that's uh, not in some sense satisfactory because for many liquid crystals, n is equivalent to minus n. So that a better description is via a line field in which you identify the mean orientation by the line through the origin that's parallel to it. Now, I, I just show you this picture of the twisting pneumatic display. We've already had this explained. I won't say any more, but it, it, it features a little bit later, so I have to. So now, how, how are you going to model liquid crystals? So a very, a very appealing um, thing to do is to use molecular dynamics. I mean, after all, the, the, the that formed of molecules and they're interacting. So that seems to be the natural uh, way to go about it. So here is a, I, I want to show you a, a, a Monte Carlo simulation, not done by me, but by uh, Claudio Zanoni and his group. 
using uh, a particular potential, which I don't write down, but which is the gay burn potential, so which models the interaction between the atoms, so, uh, between the molecules, which are represented by ellipsoids. And the interaction potential depends on the distance between the, the, um, the, uh, the, the molecules and their relative orientation. It's a sort of anisotropic Leonard-Jones uh, potential. So here's the it, it, it's in fact a simulation of the twisted pneumatic display done with almost a million molecules. Now the, bat, now the, the orientations are color coded so vertically upwards is blue, in the y direction it's green and in the x direction it's red. And so the boundary conditions, because the, the, the top and bottom plates have a, uh, a preferred orientation, are, are, are implemented by fixing uh, the, uh, the orientation of the atoms in, 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 in layers. I think there are nine, nine, nine molecules thick at top and bottom, but in, 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 in directions that are orthogonal to one another. So this is the starting configuration, which is in some sense where all the molecules... So here the, we're starting with no field, and, 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 and the molecules are all pointing upwards in the middle. That's not what should happen. It should be this helical structure. And then you set the thing going, and you see the, um, well, what is supposed to be the helical structure appear. So let me see if I can find out where that, why is it, you know, oh, there we go, there we go. Okay, so on the right is the, is the, uh, is the, is the light viewed from on top. Uh, and so you see that a, a, as things go, so there's no field at the moment, and so it becomes bright. And, and you can sort of identify what's going on with the, with the helical structure. And now they put on the field in the simulation, so it's a vertical field, and now you'll see the, the, the things becoming blue in this area and the, and the pixel becoming dark over here. So this is a, you know, this is a pretty big computation. Uh, it's not done with a realistic number of molecules, even though there's a million of them. Um, for me, I think the most interesting thing to, is to see how dynamic it is and how, how, you know, how, many, how, how all these fluctuations are. So, um, so, but, but, you know, to go from, the picture, from this simulation to the helical structure is, is, you know, is, not, is not very easy. And, um, uh, and, and so you're not going to find out using molecular dynamics things like helical structures and structures of defects and so on. So for that we need a continuum model. So I'm going to be discussing continuum models. And so we um, start with a, with a, a pneumatic liquid crystal uh, filling some container omega in R3. And, uh, and to keep things simple, I'm just going to consider static configuration, so the fluid velocity is going to be zero. So the only thing of interest is the orientation of the, um, of the uh, liquid crystal molecules. And so we have to decide on, on, on microscopic uh, state variables. So we're going to represent a typical liquid crystal molecule by a three-dimensional region M which could be a sort of rod or ellipsoid or a parallel pipette of approximately the same shape and symmetry as the molecule. And we're going to place M in some standard position with, the cent with its centroid at the origin. So for example, in this case, if it was a rectangular parallel pipette, I put the, 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 the axes as, as shown and the, and the origin is the centroid of this, of this uh, molecule. And we, we define the isotropy groups which are the are the the sets of well look at gm plus first of all the plus means because we've got um, rotations with with the determinant plus one so uh, these are so so3 is is uh, is orthogonal matrices with determinant plus one and this is the set of rotations that map the molecule into itself okay. uh, gm is the set of rotations plus reflections which which, which map the molecule to itself. So uh, these are just orthogonal matrices. Now, um, if those two are the same, that means that there's essentially no reflections uh, which, we, we, which are symmetry elements, and, and then the molecule is, is, is said to be chiral. So that would be the case for, for cholesterics. Now, when, when, if you have two rotations, R and R tilde, uh, when, when, uh, and we, we use them to rotate M, the molecule, when do we get the same set? Well, that's when Rm is equal to R tilde M as a set, 
And that happens if and only if R tilde transposed R is in this uh, isotropy group uh, Gm+. Plus. So the orientation of a molecule can be represented by an element of a, of a space of cosets, say it doesn't matter whether you take right cosets or left cosets. Uh, since, since this Gm plus is not in general a normal subgroup of SO3, this is not a group usually, so, but it's a set of subsets. So this is described very nicely in this review article of, of Mermin. So for example, if you had a, a cylindrical rod or an ellipsoid of revolution, then you, you, can, you can do a little calculation and identify this space of cosets with RP2, that's the real projective plane, which, it, which is the same as the set of lines through the origin, uh, or equivalently pairs of antipodal uh, unit vectors. That was the way that Peter uh, described it. So, so in the case of, of, of molecules that look like this, not that the ones we seem to have do look like this, it seems to me, but anyway, um, uh, then, then, then indeed RP2 is the, is the, is the right sort of microscopic um, uh, variable to use. Okay, so now, so here's our container again, uh, and uh, so how are we going to describe the molecular orientations of pneumatics? So we look at the point X, and we look at a little, a little uh, neighborhood of the point X. So uh, here it is blown up, it's the ball center X radius delta. So delta is going to be very small, so this, so this neighborhood is effectively a point, but nevertheless big enough to contain lots of molecules. Okay, so, uh, and here are some of those molecules. And now we're going to pick one at, at random, and we're going to, here it is, and we're going to um, um, uh, uh, um, uh, represent it, its orientation by this pair of antipodal unit vectors, an element of RP2. And here I've done a spatial, a spatial average over some little ball, but in reality you, you would probably want to average over some small time interval as well, because there's all, all sorts of thermal motion uh, going on. Okay, now, so, so now the distribution of orientations of the molecules in this little ball can be represented by some probability measure on RP2. That's a, that's a measure, if you like. An, another way of thinking about that is a, a measure. So this measure depends on the point X, but I'm going to, for, uh, for a few slides, forget about its dependence on the point X, just imagining that the point X is fixed. So it's a probability measure. So a, a, a probability measure on RP2 can be thought of as being a, a, a probability measure on the unit sphere, which is symmetric. Namely, it gives the same measure to a set E as to minus E. So, one example would be mu is a half a direct mass at the vector E plus a direct mass at the vector minus E. So that represents a state of perfect alignment parallel to E. Okay? And, and, and we have this average here in order to, to make sure that it satisfies this uh, symmetry condition. So this state of perfect alignment one would usually regard as unphysical and we'll see that this, that this um, arises sort of later in what I'm going to do. Now usually then we have a continuously distributed measure so given by a probability density function rho of p so dp is the element of, of surface area on the sphere s2 and so rho of course is non-negative it integrates up to 1 on the sphere, and it's, and it's symmetric, rho of p is rho of minus p to, to fulfill uh, this condition. So this is the kind of uh, density function that Peter has been talking about. Okay, now we could use the whole probability measure, mu, but Dejen, uh, Dejen proposed using moments of mu as macroscopic order parameters, and the first moment is zero by the symmetry condition. So, uh, so the, the, the first, the first non-trivial information you get is from the second moment, and the second moment can be defined to be the integral over S2 of the tensor product, that's the same thing as the dyadic product that, that Peter was talking about, uh, integrated against the measure. So what is this? This is a, this is a well, first of all, it's a 3 by 3 matrix, got by integrating a 3 by 3 matrix, and, and it's symmetric, because it's integrating a symmetric matrix. Uh, it's it's, um, it's non-negative, so that's very important. So, so if, you, if, you, if you calculate m, say, e dot e, 
Okay, then we get, so where e is, a un, uh, e is a unit vector, then m e dot e is the integral of p dot e squared. So it's an integrating a non-negative function, so this is a non-negative matrix. And its trace, well, uh, you can take the trace inside the integral, so the trace of m is the integral of p dot p, p is a unit vector, so it's the trace of 1, and you're integrating a probability measure, so the trace of m is 1. Okay, but... Uh, as we've seen, uh, de Gen, uh, I mean, this is really the most natural variable to use, but de Gen didn't like things which had trace 1, it seems, so he took away um, uh, one-third the identity. So, so he defined Q to be M minus its value in the isotropic case. So in the, in the, in the isotropic case, the measure is, is d mu 1 over 4 pi times uh, the element of surface, and if you calculate what, what M is for that case, it turns out to be one-third the identity. So we call that M0. And then Q is got by subtracting uh, M0 from M. So explicitly it's given by the integral of P tends to P minus a third the identity uh, with respect uh, to the measure. And now, of course, Q is, uh, is symmetric still. Now its trace has been uh, fixed to be zero. And now if we look at the eigenvalues of Q, so remember that M was a, um, a, a non-negative matrix, so, uh, so that means that um, Q plus a third the identity is a, a non-negative matrix. So if I look at the minimum, so Q is a, a real 3 by 3 matrix, it has three real eigenvalues. Its minimum eigenvalue, lambda min, must therefore be bigger than or equal to minus a third. So one of the first things that struck me about this, this theory, when I started working on this a few years ago, was what it was in the theory that preserved, I mean, for example, Peter was showing lots of dynamical equations, right? So what is it in the theory that preserves this constraint? Okay. Um, for some of the theories, the answer to that question is that there is nothing in the theory that preserves the constraint. But anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this later. Now. If, if two eigenvalues of Q are equal, and this is the uniaxial case, so Q then has this representation of a scalar order parameter S times the tensor product of, of, of a unit vector with itself minus a third the identity, and this condition that the minimum eigenvalue is bigger than or equal to minus a third gets translated into S being between uh, minus a half and one. So I should have said that the minimum eigenvalue being bigger or equal to minus a third also means that the maximum eigenvalue is less than or equal to two-thirds. That's because the trace is zero and the sum of the eigenvalues is zero. So that's why you get a, a both an upper bound and a lower bound uh, from here. And, and, and in fact, as, as has already been discussed, it's not very easy. In fact, it's extremely difficult to find cues that are, are, are um, not uniaxial. So to find cues that are not very close to uniaxial with a constant value of s, so Peter said 0.8, but I, well, I'm not sure what the general thing, 0.6 to 0.7, okay. And we're going to see why, why that's to be expected uh, in a moment. Um, so now the, uh, so we're doing statics, uh, as I said, so, um, now so the landau de Gen free energy uh, functional at temperature theta is a function of this matrix, it's a functional of this matrix Q, which is presumed to be got from by integrating over omega a density of C that depends on Q and its spatial gradient and the temperature. And uh, so there are various sort of invariance requirements that you, you, you should have. So, so there's frame indifference so that observers using different um, coordinate systems will, will, uh, will measure the same uh, energy density, so of C of Q star D star theta has got to equal of C Q D theta, where Q star is R Q R transpose, R is a rotation, and D star is, is this third order. So D is, is a dummy for the gradient of Q, so it has three indices Q I J comma K, so uh, that's what d i j k is, and, and d star i j k is got by this usual sort of formula. Okay, and, and material symmetry that distinguishes pneumatics from cholesterics implies that the same holds also for reflections, and therefore you, 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 you get that this, that this relation here holds for R's in O3 and not just in SO3 if you're doing uh, pneumatics, and that's 
what in the trade is said to be an isotropic function of, 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 of this second order tensor and this third order tensor. And there are various representation theorems for such, um, for such functions, but they're very complicated. Um, now, it's convenient to split the, um, the, uh, the free energy density into two pieces. So first of all, you put the, the uh, spatial gradient equal to zero. So then you get a function just of q and theta that's called the bulk energy. And then you have to correct it, of course, by subtracting it off again. And what's left is the bit that really depends on the gradient of, of q, and that's called the elastic energy. And so let's, let's consider uh, following De Gen and, and, and there's a nice little paper on Mottram, of Mottram and Newton, Introduction to Q Tensor Theory, that you can find on, uh, on, on Mottram's uh, webpage in, in Strathclyde. So let's consider this classical case, which Peter already mentioned uh, as arriving from some expansion around the isotropic uh, case. For the bulk energy, uh, a cortic, so, uh, so it's... Uh, it's um, um, a, a temperature dependent coefficient, so it's linear in the temperature. So actually there are, there are the, the temperature is theta, theta star is a constant, alpha is a constant, b and c are constants. And so this is, a, this is the trace of q squared, so this is quadratic, this is cubic, and this is uh, quartic. So it's a quartic form. So you can ask the question, at the temperature theta, what are the matrices q that minimize this uh, function. Okay? And so you do a calculation and you find that you get a phase transformation at the critical temperature theta critical which is given by this formula theta star plus 2b squared over 27 alpha c. And so if theta is bigger than this temperature then the unique minimizer of a cb is given by q equals zero which is consistent with having an isotropic fluid from the definition of, of Q. And if theta is less than theta critical, then the minimizers are indeed uniaxial with a specific value of the scalar order parameter. So the, so the minimizers, you can have any unit vector n here, and, uh, and, um, uh, and there's a, a scalar order parameter given in terms of the parameters. I should, I should have mentioned that for some reason that I don't understand, there's a difference in, of a factor 3 over 2 between uh, the, this Q so my Q tensor and Peter's Q tensor, but this, this of course is completely unimportant. Uh, so. Okay, so 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 now we see uh, some kind of reason why one might see uniaxial um, uh, 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 tensors Q. Now we now now we have to we have to also uh, say something about the dependence on the gradient of Q. So here's here are four isotropic functions each of which is quadratic in the gradient of Q. So I1, I2, and I3 are the only uh, f quadratic functions just of the, um, well, linear combinations of those three are the only um, quadratic functions just of the gradient of Q that are isotropic. Now I4 is more, more, more contentious. It's one of six possible cubic uh, terms which are isotropic and quadratic in the gradient of Q. But there's this Q out the front, so this also depends on Q. So I, I'm, taking, I'm going to take for the elastic energy a linear combination of these things. One could have taken all the, all the cubic terms if you wanted, but this is a sort of representative case. Now the, um, it's worth noting that I1 minus I2, that's a, that's a null Lagrangian. So um, it can be represented as a divergence so it's, its integral is a surface term. So you see it's a divergence because there's a, a cancellation of, of second uh, derivatives here. So if you like the Euler-Lagrange equation corresponding to I1 minus I2 just reduces to 0 equals 0. It's satisfied by every, every uh, Q. So we're interested then in minimizers of uh, the bulk energy, well, whatever we choose that to be, plus uh, uh, an elastic energy, and I'm choosing the elastic energy to be a linear combination of these four invariants with coefficients Li that are possibly temperature dependent. Uh, and um, all right, so 
so we want to. So I'm going to be interested in minimizers of this, and as I'll, I'll um, say uh, maybe in the in the second lecture. So part of the model, I mean, he, here's the energy functional, right? But part of the model has also to be what space of functions Q you minimize this in, because if you change the function sp I mean, in general, for the calculus variations, if you change the function space, you can change the minimizers. So, therefore, the function space must be part of the model. So you can ask, well, where does the function space come from? Which is a, a good and deep question, I think. But, I mean, I mean, one way you might think of getting the function space is by some kind of molecular to continue a model. Uh, so you take some kind of limit, which will produce not only the the, the energy functional itself, but the space. Okay. And there are some sort of rudimentary calculations in other contexts which, which, which could uh, sort of go in that direction. Now, if you're going to deal with cholesterics, you can add to this, this term in red here, uh, which, is, uh, which, is, which is actually linear in the gradient of Q. It's quadratic, but it's linear in the gradient of Q. And I've, I've I ignored those very important contributions to the energy due to interaction with electromagnetic fields. Of course, they're extremely important practically, but um, in terms of the analytical challenges, if you like, that they don't add too much in terms of the way of, in, in terms of difficulty. So we're ignoring them here. Okay, now, if those elastic constants there are small, then it's reasonable to, um, to use a constraint theory in which you minimize just the bulk energy. Okay. So minimizing the bulk energy um, uh, it, certainly if we use the, um, the cortic form uh, that uh, uh, I showed before, is, uh, w w requires that Q is, is uniaxial with a constant scalar order parameter. So now, now we have this, this constraint, uh, so we no longer have the bulk energy. The bulk energy is, if you like, zero, but, but we, we're, we've replaced it by this constraint. And then, uh, in this theory, you just have to m uh, minimize the elastic energy, but subject to this constraint. Okay, so everything, if you like, is supposed to be at the bottom of the energy wells of the bulk energy, and then you just minimize the um, um, elastic energy. And, the, and, there's, and there's various uh, fairly recent works, in particular by Apala and Agia Zarnescu, uh, uh, which, which study, in some sense, uh, uh, this limit as the Li goes to zero in an uh, in, with, with the aim of justifying such a, such a theory and, and, and saying other things too. Okay, now, so if you use this constraint theory, then, then um, well, I mean, what do we have? We have, a, we have a formula for Q in terms of N. Okay, so now the, 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 the land hydrogen energy has an has a, has a, you know, energy density that depends on Q and the gradient of Q. So here's, here's Q. So that's expressed in terms of n. So the gradient of Q, you can just differentiate it, so you get things like S gradient n tends to n plus n tends to gradient n, terms like that. In any case, if you take this and you shove it into here, then you will get the ozane frank energy, which is, unsurprisingly, given in terms of n as a function of n and its gradient, its spatial gradient, and its, and its quadratic in the gradient of n, because the, because the elastic energy in terms of q was quadratic in the gradient of q. And if you choo choose those four constants, L1 up to L4, uh, the coefficients of those terms in the elastic energy, then the k's here in this theory are given in terms of the l's by, by uh, in fact, an invertible 4 by 4 matrix. So you can, g given s, which is a, a given constant, a non-zero constant, uh, you can go from the L's to the K's or from the K's to the L's. And so those four constants, L1 up to L4, turn into these four constants of the ozane frank theory. And here's the null Lagrangian appearing. Uh, uh, so it's, it's K2 plus K4 times this, this expression here. Uh, and as I put in the term that you would get, if you wanted to have the modification for uh, cholesterics. So for pneumatics, this term here is, uh, is zero. 
Now, what about defects? Well, um, in, the, in this constrained land hydrogen or ozone frank theory, these are described by point or line discontinuities in the director or line field. So here are some examples. So in the constrained theory, what possible um, uh, um, uh, defects could you have? Well, the simplest would be the, would be the hedgehog, and that, uh, that's when n is just it points out radially from some point. So n of x is x over norm x. And so you can compute the gradient of n, uh, uh, n of x, uh, and uh, so it e equals this. So the gradient squared is, is 2 over the radius squared. So now, in order for the integral of the gradient of n squared to be finite, uh, you need the integral of r to the... So in order for the gradient of n to the power p to be finite, you need that the integral of r squared, that's the area element, times a gradient of n to the... So, this is, so the gradient of n is of order 1 over the radius. So the gradient of n to the p is of order 1 over the radius to the power p. So this is, this is finite, um, so, so <coughs> if and only if p is less than 3. So the Sobolev space W1p, which is gradients in... Uh, having p -th power integral finite, that's, that's W1p. So q and n will belong to W1p if and only if p is less than 3. So we want to, because our, our functional is quadratic, our energy function is quadratic in the gradient of q, we want to use as a function space W12. And because uh, that's the space of, 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 of q's or n's which have finite energy. And so here you see we're okay. This, uh, this, uh, this um, singularity uh, does have finite energy because 2 is less than 3. Okay. On the other hand, as has already been observed, for line defects the situation is different. So if you have a line defect, so in this case we have a cylinder with an axis and the n points radially outwards uh, uh, perpendicular to the axis, uh, so in the x1, x2 plane, as shown, and here it, here it is, now little r is the two-dimensional radius, the gradient of n is of the order 1 over the two-dimensional radius, and then n, n and q belong to uh, w1, p, if and only if 1 is less than or equal to p, strictly less than 2. So, since we have a quadratic model, here's a, here's a defect, a line defect, which has infinite energy, which is not a good thing. Right. So, of course, there's lots of discussions about this, and, and, and one of the advantages of the Landau de Gen theory is, is that it will get you out of this problem. It will, it will um, but, it, but it substitutes this problem for other problems, but, but, but at least it gets you out of this problem. It's possible in the Landau de Gen theory to represent uh, disclinations and they have finite energy. But there's other ways you could do it. Uh, I mean, for example, you could just change the I mean, you could stick with the director description. It's quadratic, but I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's prob probably uh, that, that, that ozone frank functional is only meaningful for the gradients of n which are relatively small, or at least not, not absolutely vast anyway. So you could very easily keep the function exactly the same for the gradient of n, you know, less than a billion, and, and then change it at infinity so that it's subquadratic, or, or, or do something like this. So it goes as, you know, gradient of n to the power 3 over 2. Then immediately this problem would disappear. Now whether that would give you a good description of what happens, I don't know. But I mean, it, it is a possibility. And of course it's, its advantage would be that we don't have to consider matrices, we just have to consider vector fields. So there are much, you know, much fewer variables. And there's other things you can do along this line. You can change function spaces in different ways which will, um, so, you know, sticking with n, you can s sort this problem at some level, but, but you know, wh whether, whether this is a, a good thing to do, I really don't know. Okay, however, there are other singularities, uh, index one-half singularities, here's, here's one of them. So here, here the, the, you have to understand this as that the line field is supposed to be tangent to the lines that you see. So here is in one of these in, in, in carbo nanotubes that form uh, liquid crystals, and here's another one that actually Peter showed. So, so these are index one half singularities, and these are never in W12. These also have uh, infinite energy according to quadratic models, and in, for a reason that we'll see, they are worse than the other defects that I've shown. They're more, if we like, they're they're more stable, if you like. 
harder to get rid of. Okay, so what about existence for the landau dugen theory? So this is the unconstrained case. So there is a result in the literature due to Davis and Chuck Gartland. So, uh, so what's the hypothesis? So we have a bounded domain with smooth boundary. For the bulk energy, you can take anything that's continuous, continuous function of Q. Uh, so this is, here we, we, we just work at a fixed temperature, theta. So a continuous function of Q, which is bounded below. Now, we're going to suppose that L4, which was the coefficient of that sort of somewhat controversial term, is zero. And then there are some inequalities between the other between the other terms. So these inequalities have the, have the, have the, they are necessary and sufficient that you have convexity with respect to the gradient. That's what these, these, um, these are there for. And then you, then, then let's take some simple boundary conditions where Q is specified on the boundary to be some given uh, Q bar, a given function Q bar. And then this, this functional that we've been considering attains a minimum on the set of Qs in W12 which uh, satisfy the boundary conditions. So this is a, an essentially a, you know, w w what is a, a more or less elementary um, uh, uh, application of the direct method of the calculus of variations. Anybody who knows the direct method would be able to... I mean, the only difficult thing is really what these inequalities are to get you convexity with respect to the gradient. Otherwise, it's relatively s straightforward stuff if you're an analyst. And in the cortic case, when C of B has that cortic form, you can use elliptic regularity to show that any minimizer Q star is smooth. So that's already interesting because that shows that, the, that you're, not going to get, you're not going to see defects in the landau dugen theory in terms of singularities. Okay. So you've got to see them some other way. But what if... Uh, L4 is not zero, okay, so, well, okay, so a parlor and I proved this thing, which is it's not very surprising, but, so if L4 is not zero, and a CB is a continuous function of Q and theta, which is bounded below, then whatever your boundary conditions, then the energy is unbounded below, okay, so in fact, when I say what, whatever your boundary conditions, what I mean is you can, you can, you can take any Q that makes this finite, and then, well away from the boundary, in some little ball, you can change Q in such a way that uh, this energy becomes unbounded. So, it, it, whatever the boundary conditions are, it doesn't make any difference. Okay? So, this, so this, this would appear to say that L4 should be zero. However, in my second lecture, I will, uh, I will, I will take the view that L4 certainly can be not zero, and it's perfectly okay. But, but but here it looks as if it's um, impossible. Now in the constrained land dugen theory, so now you're just minimizing the elastic energy uh, but subject to this constraint, then, then you can even do it for L4 not equal to zero. There's no problem there uh, um, because, uh, because in fact the Q is bounded. So that's, that, that's, that's, the, um, that's the reason effectively. And minimizers are not in general smooth and the singularities represent defects. So in the, in the constraint theory, defects are represented by singularities. But in, in this full theory, then you've got to, you've got to um, understand uh, defects in terms of things like the coalescence of eigenvalues and discontinuous behavior of eigenvectors. You can have a Q that depends smoothly on X, but its eigenvectors can have discontinuities when the eigenvalues coincide. So there's various uh, people who have investigated this kind of thing. Now, so I want to end today with, with this question as to whether the derivation of the ozone frank theory is correct or not. So this is uh, joint work with Argier Zarnescu. So, um, so the point is that uh, we started, I mean, I started by saying that, that uh, one should represent um, well, one should use line fields and not uh, vector fields. And yet, somewhere in, this, in, in, in going from the landau dugen theory to the uh, ozone frank theory, we ended up with a vector field. So what happened? What did, what, what did we do to get a vector field when it should have been a line field? Okay? We did something wrong. Okay? And so, so here's, the, here's, our, here's part of this story. So suppose you've got a Q that's in, say, in the Sobolev space W11. That's the largest Sobolev space. And it is 
it, it, is, it satisfies the constraint. So it's given by this constant times n of x times n of x minus a third the identity, where n of x is a unit vector. Okay. So we say it's orientable if you can... Okay, so the point about Q is that, that n is only defined up to sine. So you can always change the sine of n, and it doesn't change Q. Okay, so so the, we say it's orientable if you can choose a sign for n at each point x such that, that q is, um, well, such that the, 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 this, this uh, new unit vector field is in fact in a Sobolev space. Right? So, so for each x we can choose n tilde to be plus or minus n of x and a unit vector so that n tilde has sufficient regularity to have a well-defined uh, gradient. So the point is that, I mean, so you should think of this, that at each point you have, um, you ha you have a, at each point x, you have a, um, if you like, a, a line field. So if you like, a double-headed arrow at each point. So here's one point, here's another point, x. Okay, so now you can easily turn that into a, that's a line field, right? So each point you've got a, you've got a, two antipodal unit vectors. You can easily turn that into a vector field. You just rub out one of the arrows, you know. And now you've got a vector field. But of course if you do that, you'll have very bad, in general, you'll have very bad regularity for the vector field, and it won't have a gradient. So, the, so here, here's a kind of definition. It's saying that, it, this, that this vector field is orientable if we can, at each point, rub out one of the arrows, so that what we've got left has enough regularity to make it a, a uh, to have a gradient. Okay? So here, the, here, in some sense, S is, is a lifting, so RQ is a map from omega to RP2, and we're wanting to lift it to a map from omega to S2. Okay? So that's in jargon, but it's a, it's, a, it's a lifting in a Sobolev space, that's the tricky thing. So, now, you can ask, if you have an orientable Q, how many orientations can it have? And the answer is, it can have exactly two orientations. So, very intuitive, you can, if you've got, if you've got one orientation, then the only other thing you can do is to reverse the direction of all the arrows. And that's the only other orientation. Okay, so this is a, a little, it's, I, I don't get the proof here, it's not very difficult, but it's not, not, not absolutely immediate, but it's, 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 it's not very difficult to do. So, uh, if it's orientable, it's, it's only orientable in two ways. Now, so here's a worrying example. So, here's a smooth uh, line field that's not orientable. Okay? So, this is on a non-simply connected region. So, either think of it in two dimensions or three dimensions outside this cylinder. So, the line field has to be a tangent to these dotted lines. So, let's try to orient it. So to the left here, you see, we only have two choices. Either the arrows go all to the, all to the right or all to the left. And then by this little result I just mentioned, they've got to, so let's suppose they go all to the right. That's just one choice. Okay, so then they're going to have to continue going to the right, round here. And so when you get down here, they're going to the left. But in this blue region to the left of the blue region, they're going to the right. Well, that's impossible because... That's a third orientation. So obviously in this blue region you can either have the arrows going to the right or the arrows going to the left. And this is a, a, a situation where you've got arrows going both to the right and left. It's a contradiction. So this is not orientable, even though it is smooth. Okay. And what's more, these index one-half singularities are also not orientable. So here you can have, these are not orientable and you're in a simply connected region. The same sort of argument. If you try to orient this, then they have, the arrows have to go up this way, they have to go this way, but they're going down in this, this way. So, so these are, are never orientable, and, and that's the same for this, uh, for this case. This is just the same example as I just gave when the inner radius of the cylinder is zero. Okay. So here's a theorem that uh, if omega is simply connected and Q is in W12, so that's finite energy, then Q is orientable. Uh, so there's, a, uh, there's another result uh, reference there, which is in some sense more general, but, but in some sense less general. Well, I don't know. Anyway, I, I mention it. OK, 
Okay, so what this means is for us is that in a simply connected region, the uniaxial de Gen theory and the ozone Frank theories are equivalent. You can always orient the line field. Okay. So um, here's an interesting consequence. So take an index one half singularity and uh, ask whether you can modify the Q tensor in, in a core around the, uh, the line defect so that it has finite landau de Gen energy, you know, and, and, and stays in the constrained theory. So uh, this is telling you you can't do it, because if you could do it, then the region here would be simply connected, therefore it would be orientable, but the argument I gave about non-orientability works outside this core. So this shows that this kind of uh, index one-half singularity is, is topologically much more difficult to destroy somehow, at least in this, in this kind of uh, uh, theory. So, for example, if you take the line disclination, you can do such a, 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 a modification in the core, and that's moving into the third, the escape into the third dimension, if people know what that means. So, so, th so these kinds of singularities are, are, are sort of more difficult to get rid of, if you like, than the, than the uh, line disclination. So finally, here's a, an example, it's academic and a bit artificial, but which shows that you, you know, which sort of makes more precise the, the worry that uh, you've not derived quite the right theory here. So here's a two-dimensional example. So here's the region. It's, it's non-simply connected, of course, because we, 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 we know we need that. Uh, uh, between, so it's a kind of stadium with two holes removed. And we're going to suppose that we have tangent boundary conditions on the outer boundary. So the line field has to be parallel to the outer boundary. And on the inner boundaries, we'll, we'll, we'll leave everything free. So there's no boundary condition on the, on the inner circles. And I'm going to take the very simplest case possible, which is of the constraint theory, so that we just take uh, sort of the one constant approximation. So I of Q is just the integral of the gradient of Q squared. And formally, if we do this, this uh, process of going from Q to N, uh, this, the, that turns into twice S squared times the integral of the gradient of N squared. Okay, so now. Here we have uh, the, uh, the situation. Now, the, notice that the boundary data is orientable. We can either go around clockwise or we could go around anticlockwise. Let's suppose we go around uh, clockwise. And now let's look and see what happens if you go along. Suppose now that you've got a, um, a, a, a line field that's orientable. Now, in that case, it's got to go from, if you go across a line like this, it's got to go from pointing upwards at the left-hand end to pointing downwards at the right-hand end. So it's got to go across something like this. So if you integrate along this line, you get some kind of lower bound for the energy. Okay. So um, on the other hand, uh, you, could, you could consider this line field. Right? So this is a, this is a competitor uh, which, is, which satisfies the boundary. This is a non-orientable line field. Its gradient in the middle here is zero because it's constant. Okay, so, so you can see that um, if, if this distance is large enough, this will beat this because, because uh, you, know, you, you, you have a lower bound for the integral, and so the, the two-dimensional, the, the, for this one-dimensional integral, so the two-dimensional integral will, 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 will grow as m increases, and it will always beat uh, this. So this, this shows that uh, for m large enough, in, and in fact, well, more detailed analysis shows for any M, uh, the minimum energy configuration is unoriented, even though there's a minimizer among oriented maps. Okay? But the actual, the, the minimizer for the constraint theory is in fact not oriented. And of course, if you, if you, had, if you had chosen for boundary conditions, the tangential boundary conditions on the outer boundary, plus the, the, the boundary conditions given by this uh, uh, a line field here on the inner circles, then um, in fact there's no orientable um, uh, 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 Q that, that, that has finite energy at all. So in this case you couldn't use the ozone Frank theory at all. I mean in, in, in this case you could sort of maybe use it and patch it together somehow, but, but here you couldn't use it at all. Okay, so that's all I've got uh, to say uh, today and, and, and tomorrow I'll talk about this issue of the eigenvalue constraints and what uh, does or doesn't um, 
uh, enforce them in, 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 in theories for um, the Q tensor. Is there any questions? You, you, you 